everybody. I'm back. And it's good to be back. Or is it? When I was a kid, I used to watch a lot of cartoons, and one of my favorites had a regular segment called Good Idea, Bad Idea. It went something like this. Good idea. Taking a deep breath before diving into a swimming pool. Bad idea. Taking a deep breath after diving into a swimming pool. These were funny because good and bad are so obvious. Impossible to get wrong. We all agree on what good and bad are, right? Sitting by a cozy fire in winter is good. Sitting in a cozy fire is bad. Simple. But when it comes to education, politics, sexuality, we human being people persons regularly disagree on what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. Take abortion, for example. Yeah, we're jumping right into the deep end of the pool. Some say it's good and right to care for and defend women with unwanted pregnancies, show them compassion and kindness by terminating the pregnancy and giving them their lives back. Others say, no, it's good and right to care for and defend innocent unborn human beings. Show them compassion and kindness by not letting them be killed. What about sexuality? Some say it's good to support all consensual sexual expression, allow people to love and be loved on their own terms so they'll feel valued and fulfilled. Others say no, it's good to reserve sexuality for monogamous husband and wife relationships, building secure, loving families and avoiding disease so people will feel valued and fulfilled. Everyone's claiming their point of view is the good one, their point of view is the right one. So how do we really know what's right and wrong? It's not as easy as good idea, bad idea. Most people think of goodness like a sliding scale. On one side, we have the baddest of the bad. Kicking puppies, voting for Hitler, and all the sequels to The Matrix. Nah, 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 nah. All of them. On the other side, we have the goodiest of the good. Chocolate milk, free chocolate milk, and unlimited free chalky milk. But hold up, says my buddy Carl. I hate chocolate milk. Carl places it on the other end of the scale, because milk gives Carl the bubble guts. The goodness of chocolate milk is subjective. It's based on the subject's opinion. So I say it's good, Carl says it's bad, nobody's right or wrong, we just live and let live when it comes to beverages, except for prohibition. But is morality also subjective? Not so fast, or quick. Now, let's raise the stakes. Imagine a country. We'll call them the People's Republic of We Were Gonna Kill You. They decide to invade another country to take their resources and enslave their people. Free stuff and a free labor force. That's good. But the other country, we'd rather you not extend, says, no, that's bad. It would be good to let us live our lives in peace. If morality is subjective, what determines who is right? What's the tiebreaker here? Power. Violence, oppression, might makes right. The strongest gets their way because there's no standard of right and wrong above opinions. Subjective morality is survival of the fittest and most ruthless. Back to our milk analogy. Carl and I might disagree on milk being good, but what about the statement, milk contains lactose? That statement is objective. It's based on the object itself. So if I say milk contains lactose, and Carl disagrees, we can't both be right. And because of science, we know milk objectively contains lactose. So it really doesn't matter what I, or Carl, or anyone says, when they say it, or where they say it. Even if the entire world agrees that lactose is just a myth, if Carl drinks that glass, the next thing he'll be doing is praying that big handicap stall in the bathroom isn't occupied because it's bubblegut mageddon. <laughs> Opinions do not change the objective truth. But is there an objective standard for morality that transcends culture and time and opinions? Spoiler alert, yes, but stay tuned anyway. To identify objective morality, we're going to need two things. First, a clear standard, not evolving morality. That's like a football game where everybody's making up their own rules and the goalposts never stop moving. Pretty fun to watch, probably, but guaranteed chaos. Second, we need a reliable judge who gets the final say on interpreting morality, because clear rules won't do us much good if nobody understands those rules, or if the referee isn't being honest. We human being people persons clearly are not up to that task. Hitler thought genocide and world domination was good, but don't just blame him. He only got as far as he did because millions of people agreed with him. 
Throughout history, people all over the world thought slavery was a good idea. Then there's MKUltra, where the CIA kidnapped, drugged, experimented on, and even killed United States citizens, but no charges were ever filed because most of our government agreed it was for the greater good. That's not a conspiracy theory. Congress admitted it. So, we need a clear standard and a reliable judge who is not just another corrupt human. Some people point to world religions to explain morality, but can they pass the test? With Islam, Muslims say right and wrong are determined by their god Allah, who they admit is still capable of doing evil if he wants, but wrong actions become good simply because Allah does them. So morality is a moving target based on Allah's whims. No clear standard, and a judge who is not obligated to be honest with us about it. Hinduism has a seemingly never-ending supply of gods and philosophies that often disagree with each other, and more than a few of those gods, like Krishna, are known for being deceitful tricksters. No clear standard, judged by deceptive gods and imperfect people. Buddhism emphasizes compassion, nonviolence, and mindfulness as ultimate good. Buddhism and Taoism have no gods per se, so their morality is determined by imperfect human beings, just like you and me. And just like every single Thailand Buddhist temple monk who tested positive for meth after a drug raid in November of 2022. And just like the Dalai Lama himself, who sexually assaulted a young boy in public in April of this year. So those don't work. There's Hollywood religion. No, not that one. You know, the one where good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. If there is a hell. Probably not though, right? Which is what I think most Westerners believe these days. How good is good enough for heaven on this view though? Well, less good than you, obviously, because you're the hero of this story. How bad is bad enough to go to hell? Nah, Hitler or any character portrayed by Alan Rickman. But it's just one more unclear standard judged by some really messed up people. Some folks claim objective morality can exist without appealing to a higher power. Atheists like Sam Harris say we can base morality on human flourishing. Actions that promote the well-being of conscious creatures are objectively good. And actions that harm them are objectively bad. That makes sense. Until it doesn't. Notice how Sam is smuggling in the exact concepts we're trying to measure. He's using the same scale. He's just swapping out good and bad for wellness and harm. We're right back where we started. Also, if the goal is the well-being of humans, doesn't that justify killing one healthy person to distribute their organs to 10 people on the donor list? I mean... More human survival, human flourishing. Or killing off the weak and feeble-minded who are just slowing down the human herd. We're not going to colonize Mars dragging all this dead weight around, am I right? Human flourishing. Oh, look how quickly human flourishing turns into eugenics. Human flourishing! Which makes you wonder, who gets to decide what qualifies as human flourishing? And why prioritize conscious creatures? I mean, some conscious creatures think it would be good if we all die off and leave the Earth in peace. Who's to say they're not right? Rhett McLaughlin is a popular YouTuber who famously deconstructed his Christian faith. When he was asked how he'd now teach his kids about morality without God, he said, simple. If you steal, you'll earn a reputation as a thief, and that will make your life worse. So, be a moral person, because that will make your life better. Huh. Well, that makes sense. Until it doesn't. Because if atheism is right, Rhett is wrong. If God doesn't exist, it's best to be a thief who doesn't get caught and doesn't feel bad about it. Then you get the free stuff and keep a good reputation. An adulterer who doesn't get caught? More sex without losing your marriage. Murder your annoying boss and keep your job. Be a child molester and continue your reign as the king of pop. Live your best life now. Harvey Osteen. And with an atheist worldview, World that's just fine. There's no God waiting to judge us. We're all just careening towards the eventual heat death of the entire universe anywho. It won't matter one itty tidbit if humanity achieves world peace, or we blow ourselves to smithereens in the next five minutes. Nothing really matters in the long run. It's just our selfish, me-first DNA staying alive until it inevitably won't. Like John Steinbeck wrote in The Grapes of Wrath, there ain't no sin and there ain't no virtue. There's just stuff people do. But that doesn't feel right to any of us. We know murder, slavery, rape, child abuse are wrong, no matter when or where they happen. But without objective morality, we can't say that. We can't even say Hitler was a bad guy. Just, eh, not how I would have done it. But there's one option we haven't looked at yet. With Christianity, goodness isn't subjective. 
It's based on the character of the eternal, unchanging, morally perfect God. More good equals more like God. Less like God, that's bad. Also called evil. Moving away from God in any direction is moving towards evil. Let's try this out. Is adultery more or less like God? Well, God is perfectly faithful, so adultery is bad. Making people pay for the bad things they've done? He is perfectly just, so that's like God. But offering forgiveness and mercy whenever anyone sincerely asks for it? God is perfectly forgiving and merciful, so objective morality achieved. Christianity, an unchanging standard, the immutable character of an eternal God, judged by a perfect being, God himself. But wait, some might say, believers have done horrible things in the name of God. That is true, but they don't get to judge if those things were good or bad. God does. He also judges if they were just using his name to justify the bad things they were doing. Guess how that's going to go. And he's a reliable judge. Why? Because God can't lie to us. His nature is goodness and truth. He's the source of those things. Those are components of his very existence. I'll explain. If you have a liquid and you make it so it's no longer wet, it's not a liquid anymore. If God could do something not good, he wouldn't be God. So whenever you've experienced something truly good in your life, that's because you got some God spilled on you. When we try to define goodness without God, it's like trying to explain the word wet while denying liquids exist. Any other attempt to anchor goodness falls flat with the simple response, says who? You? It's just your opinion against the people who disagree with you. Culture? Society? Which one? Ours? Victorian society? The Taliban society? It's just your opinion against theirs again. Our evolutionary programming, nature's social contract, Survival of the fittest, man. Darwinism 101. Now it's just your opinion against whoever's strong enough to shut you up. You will never get out of this unending moral thumb war until you admit we all know murder, slavery, rape are wrong, objectively. And they are only objectively wrong, not because we say so, not because society or evolution says so, because evolution says the opposite, but because those things are in direct opposition to the character of the good God who made us. Objective morality is evidence that God exists. The Bible says in Romans 2.15 that God has written his law on our hearts and that our consciences confirm this. That's where we get our inner sense of right and wrong. So when you feel guilt or you're lying in bed at night thinking of that horrible thing you did 14 years ago, that's not an evolutionary glitch. That's God's programming alerting you that you violated his community guidelines. Throughout the Bible, we're told that people will declare themselves wise and good based on their own definitions. But when they do this, they become fools, like not being able to identify what a woman is. They will call good evil and evil good. Why? Because they desire those things that are least like God, the things furthest away from him. Sexual sin, selfishness, greed, pride. You can only travel so far away from him before you have to either admit you're in the evil zone or you stop, you turn around, and defiantly say, no, this is good, and that's bad. God is evil. A lot of that going on these days. But God is good. God is the source of goodness. God is the judge of goodness. And the more like God something is, the more good it is. Objective morality is evidence that God exists. It's good to remember that, and to remember that eternity is on the line, and that lasts forever. I hope you choose wisely and keep on thinking to infinity.